So um, we're getting ready for uh, the first exam. And so uh, before we get to your questions, I wanted to uh, show just what the exam is going to look like as far as you know what you need to know and how to best prepare and so you know, this this prep guide's in top hat it's in blackboard as well um the the key idea is here so out of that first module we need to know our fundamental laws so we need to know the difference between the law of multiple proportions the law, law of definite proportions the laws of conservation <coughs> So we need to know what those are. Um, and hopefully by this point in time, there's no confusion left. Uh, we need to know how to describe matter in terms of composition, in terms of phase, in terms of properties, chemical and physical, um, and so on. We need to know how to determine the differences between pure substances and mixtures. We need to know how to do the difference between elements and compounds, compounds and mixtures. So kind of going back to that first quiz and some of the questions that were asked in the first, the first question of that first quiz. We need to be able to convert between the temperature scales. We need to be able to use the metric system and convert between the prefixes of kilo and nano. So you got to know what those prefixes mean. We need to know the difference between precision and accuracy. We need to know how to do sig figs. And so uh, that's one of the things that, you know, we've been kind of hitting from the start here. And certainly that's one of the proficiencies that we've already covered. Um, we need to know how to do density calculations. We need to know how to do unit conversion kinds of questions. Um, out of module two, we need, we need to know the basis, basics of atomic theory. We need to know the differences between protons, neutrons, and electrons, and how those things affect atomic number, mass number, atomic mass, charge, and so on. We need to know some basics of the periodic table. How do I find the metals versus the nonmetals? Where do I find noble gases, halogens, alkali metals, and so on? Um, I need to know how to calculate average atomic mass. So giving isotopic abundances and um, isotopic masses, can I do the calculation? Can I calculate that weighted average? Uh, I need to know how to do mold concept calculations, which we actually reviewed on a little bit today because those are the calculations that make up two thirds of stoichiometry. Um, but knowing how to go between grams and moles, knowing how to go between moles and molecules, um, molecules and atoms. And we need to know percent composition and empirical formulas. So in particular, can I take that percent composition value and turn it into empirical formula, much like the last question on quiz number two? Out of module three, the module that we just completed um, and quizzed over, we need to know about light and electrons. Um, we need to understand that both are dualistic. Both have wave properties and particle properties. We need to understand how those wave properties and particle properties have been applied. So um, things like the photoelectric effect, things like explaining why energy quantization exists, why atomic spectra are specific lines, uh, uh, wavelengths, as opposed to that continuous light spectrum. We need to know about the Bohr model of the atom, why it was developed, how it predicts the the spectral lines of hydrogen and why it's not completely accurate, why we had to develop the quantum mechanical model as a supplement to it. From 
quantum numbers. We need to know what the four quantum numbers describe. Um, and we need to be able to use quantum numbers to identify or describe electrons in an atom. So knowing what each quantum number describes, knowing how to get information from those four quantum numbers, how to write electron configurations, and primarily focusing on complete configurations and noble gas configurations for both atoms and ions. And then finally, periodic trends, which uh, you saw in the quiz yesterday. Um, so again, in particular, focusing on those three trends there, atomic size, ionic size, and ionization energy. Now, the exam itself is an 88-point exam, but you will only be graded out of 80. So the way I do exams is rather than having a bonus question, it's very similar to how I do your homework. Your homework is overloaded, which means that there's more there than what you're being graded for. It's the same kind of idea. It's in your best interest to try every single question, but with <clears throat> eight extra points out there, it also allows you that if you are running short on time, you could skip a question and it would not necessarily hurt you. Now, in this particular exam, there is a mobile choice section. That mobile choice section has 15 questions in it. Most of the stuff in the mobile choice section is conceptual or definition oriented. Um, so don't expect to see massive explanation kinds of problems and definitely don't expect to see calculation kinds of problems in that mobile choice section. Focus on definitions, focus on, you know, kind of simple concept things that you could very easily just kind of snap off. The short answer section, which includes calculations and includes essays, um, that is eight questions long. That's where the bulk of the points actually are coming. And this is the processes and the products, the calculations. There might be a, a short answer essay in there as well, asking you to explain or elaborate on something a little bit more detailed. As far as information that you'll be given, you will be given a periodic table. You will be given an equation sheet. Um, both of those are basically what you've been given all semester as far as you know when you take a quiz. Uh, you should be getting both of those things for every quiz. Um, things that you won't be given. You won't be given the metric to metric conversions. I told you that from the start. You're going to have to memorize the metrics, the metric prefixes and what they meant. Um, similar to the question you were asking me uh, before, that organization chart from module two, the one that uh, um, the one that had the six boxes with all the arrows connecting them, that was a guide to help you organize, similar to the mole map that I showed you today, but that's exactly what it is. It's an organizational tool to help get you started and get you familiar. You won't get that for, for the exam. You won't get that for any quiz either. Um, what do you need to bring with you? You need to bring with you a scientific calculator. By rule, we are not permitted to allow you to use graphing calculators on exams. Um, this is a rule coming straightly from, uh, directly from the American Chemical Society. They don't allow um, graphing calculators on their final exam. We're not going to let you use graphing calculators on, on the, the lead up exams either a good practice to get into. So um, make sure that you have one on hand. If you don't, um, Learning Lab has a bunch of them. Uh, you can easily borrow one from them. They might ask you for your ID or something like that. They might just give it to you. It just depends on um, how well they know you and whether they think you will get it back easily. Um, you're going to want to bring multiple pencils uh, and erasers. Um, 
even though this is not a Scantron test, um, you want the ability to revise yourself. And uh, while erasable pens do exist, they tend to be messy. And um, certainly you don't want to be in the position where you're scratching out answers and trying to um, pass on what you actually are trying to say. And you don't want me to have to guess at it either. As long as it's readable. So again, it's not a Scantron. So Scantrons require number two pencils because of the darkness of the graphite being picked up by the optical reader that gets used to feed the, the core cards through. That's why they require that particular type of graphite. Since, since you're going to be doing a paper-based test, it really doesn't matter so long as it's dark enough that I can read it and legible. Um, the other thing, um, this room is open, that is open, um, the hour before this class meets. And so I will be in here a little bit early on Friday to help get things organized and make sure that every, everything's kind of in the right place. My goal is actually to start the exam at 12 o'clock. And so if you have the ability to get here a little bit early, I would encourage you to do so. That just means you get to start a little bit earlier. You get those extra couple of minutes to make things, to make things work, make things on time. Um, now, you've got a 10 o'clock or an 11 o'clock class, rather, and you know, getting here at noon is about as good as you can do. Then we'll take as good as you can do. Um, but... My goal for you and my goal for yourselves uh, and for myself is to try to start things as soon as possible. If we have some sort of scenario where everybody's actually here early, we'll start early. Um, the other thing that you should know is that there is a class that comes in after us. So I am kind of limited in terms of the amount of time I can give you at the end of class. What I usually do is I usually give you audio warnings throughout the time saying, okay, we're 20 minutes in, we're 30 minutes in, you've got five minutes remaining, here's the end of class. At the end of class, so at 1250, I would inform everybody that class is over. I would also announce at that time that we are headed into overtime Overtime is an optional five-minute period that will end at 12.55 and give you that last five minutes to finish whatever it is that you were working on. Um, the caveat to overtime is this. If you have a one o'clock class and you're late because you stayed with me for the extra five minutes, I'm not responsible for that. Um, I'm responsible for the first 50. If I keep you here to 12.52 because I lectured too long, I'll take responsibility for that. But I'm not going to take responsibility for you staying too, too late because uh, you're trying to finish your exam. So that's kind of the overview as far as like everything is concerned. Um, does anybody have any questions uh, related to those items? All right, so I will open it up to you then and start taking your questions. And so I do have a copy of the practice exam pulled up here, but um, certainly we're not limited to um, just the practice exam if there are other things that we want to discuss or look at. The floor is yours. Anything in particular in mind? Yeah. Okay, so let's, yeah, if we're thinking about things from a definition standpoint, are, are we talking like terms or like, like concepts, laws, theories? Okay. Okay, so can, can you define what an isotope is? OK. 
Okay. Well, let's start there. There then. What is nylon? Okay, so it, not necessarily the same element, but an ion would be any substance that, that has a non-neutral charge. So we can think about elements as being charged and having, having you know, being ions. So like, for example, a fluorine, fluorine is a halogen in its elemental state, but as an ion, it is going to be a negative one charge. Oxygen is going to be a negative two charge in its in its normal state. So, you know, where do those charges come from with ions? This is for anybody. Yeah. Okay, so that that can be one way that we get ions is, is by blasting them with energy and causing the electrons to pop off. Um, but how do I recognize an ion in the first place? Well, let's, let's talk about this from the standpoint of how to recognize when we don't have an ion. So we're talking about neutrality. If I have a neutral atom, what are what are the two things that have to be equal in order for the atom to be neutral? Yeah, they have to have the same negative and positive charge. What do we call what do we call those? Protons and electrons. So charge is all about protons and electrons. Now if I change the number of protons, yes, I'm changing the number of positive charges. What else am I also changing? I'm not, I'm not necessarily changing the neutrons. I'm not necessarily changing electrons. Atomic what? Atomic number. Yeah, number of protons is the atomic number. So if I have a neutral carbon, carbon has six protons and six neutrons, or I'm sorry, six protons and six electrons. If I change that number of protons from six to eight, I don't have carbon anymore. What do I have? If I change, so I had I had six protons, six electrons. I had a neutral carbon. If I change the protons to eight. I don't have carbon anymore. What do I have? Oxygen. Eight protons would be element number eight. Element number eight is oxygen. So when we talk about ions, we aren't talking about the proton number change. Because proton number changing is changing the identity of the substance as well. That's a completely different conversation. When we talk about ions, we are talking specifically about the number of electrons. So I've got that six car that carbon six protons, six electrons. If I take one of those electrons away, so it was it's six protons now five electrons, what's the charge? Yeah. Yeah, so I started with, so I started neutral. Six protons, six electrons. If, and so this would just be carbon. If I go to an ionic state, six protons and five electrons, it's still carbon because it's still six protons, but now it's going to have a charge because there's a there's an imbalance here. What would that charge be? It, it's going to be positive. Positive what? 
positive one, I have one more proton than I do electrons. So that would give me a positive one charge. I took that same six protons and exposed it to eight electrons. It's still carbon because there are six protons still. But because the protons and electrons aren't even, it's going to be charged. So this is an ion. But what is the charge on the ion? It's going to be negative 2. So charge follows the same formula always. It's the protons minus the electrons. So 6 minus 6 gave me 0, 6 minus 5 gave me positive 1, 6 minus 8 gives me that negative 2. So when we talk about ions, what we're talking about is we have an imbalance of protons and electrons. And the imbalance that we see is reflected in the charge and it tells us what the what the ratio of, of proton and electron is. So that's the ion. Now there are other kinds of ions that we can get into. We can start talking about you know ions that are made by nonmetals versus metals. We can talk about polyatomic ions. Um, where we get into, you know, recognizing that this cluster of, of atoms bonds together covalently, but has a charge imbalance, which gives it the, the negative one, negative two, negative three, or whatever charge it is. Now, for this exam, we don't have to really worry as much about polyatomic ions. Polyatomic ions will make out much more sense when we start talking about Lewis structures in module seven. Um, and so for the most part, we'll kind of leave that for where it is. Um, and just kind of focus on, you know, looking at those ions from a nomenclature standpoint. And again, that won't even be on this exam either because we haven't done the proficiency for it. So let me see if that, I don't know if I had a question like that on the test. Oh, here, yeah, 22. Hmm? Yeah, so for, for a question like this, what you need to do is if we're trying to find the average atomic mass of a particular element, we want to take the, the isotopes that it's made out of, and we want to do a weighted average. And so to find the weighted average, what we're going to do is we're going to take the percent times the mass for each of the isotopes that are given. Okay, so let, let's let's look at this then. So um, we've got 78.99% and 23.985 and so I need to multiply those two numbers together. 78.99 and 23.985. How many significant figures should come out of this particular calculation. Four. I got 
four in the percent and five in the max, I need to I need to track the, the, the one that has fewer. So when I round this, you know, my calculator gives me, you know, 1894 and then a bunch of decimal places after, I really only need the first four sig figs, which once I round, it's going to be 1895. And the unit here is going to be AMU still. So I'm going to do the same thing. So isotope number two, I add 10.00% and 24.986 AMU. 10 times 24.986. Okay, how many significant figures are going to come out of this one? Wait for again. So 249.9 would be the proper rounding. For the last one, 11.01% times 25.9826. So yeah, same thing, like four sig figs again, 286.1. So we've done the multiplication and we did the rounding. Now we need to do the addition and we need to round it one more time. So 1895 plus 249.9. Plus 286.1, 2431.0. Now, the question is, how do we round this? And this is honestly, this is a place where we can run into this is a sig fig rule that we don't use very often. Ordinarily, when we add and subtract, all the numbers have the exact same number of significant figures, have the same number of decimal places, they're all in the same locations, it doesn't matter. But in this case, we do have them in different places. And so what we wanna look at is, where is the last estimated digit in each one of these numbers that we added together? So I'm just gonna mark it here. The last digit is here in the ones place, which means that that number in the ones place is estimated. For the second one, it's in the tenths place. So that's that first decimal place there. In the third one, it's also in the tenths place. So that's that spot right there. So I have three different measurements and they're giving me two different estimated digits. Now, honestly, in this particular case, it really doesn't matter that much because the last digit that we're looking at is a zero. But if I was trying to keep things consistent from a sig figs perspective, I would need to recognize that we can only have one estimated digit. And so the digit to the left has to be the one that we round to. So from that perspective, 2431 is the correct calculation with the proper rounding. But you may be stopping yourself still and going, well, hold on a second. I gotta identify this. There's no element that has a mass of 2,401. And if you recall from class, this is this is intentional. Remember, one of the things I told you is that it's easy to make a mistake converting the percentages into decimals. So if you divide by 10 instead of dividing by 100, or if you 
move the decimal point three places instead of two? What if you have a number that's, uh, you know, less than 1%? Uh, it's easy to you know, take 0.91 and make it 0.091 instead of 0.0091. But here, this is stating obvious and correctable easily. I need to divide by 100. When I do that, I get 24.31 AMUs, which I can look at the periodic table, and that is an exact match for magnesium. Okay. So in the next problem here, we want to know the wavelength of the radiation given by a frequency of 3.6 times 10 to the 19th hertz. Now, the, the key to this particular kind of problem is we have to recognize what, what kind of problem this is and what we're ultimately being asked to decipher. And so this is a great place where having knowledge of our equation sheet can be really good and useful to us. So you are given a problem where you know the frequency and are asked about the wavelength. Which of these equations uses both of those parameters? So here's where we have to remember a little bit of symbology. Okay, it is the speed of light equation. What we have to remember is that this is a frequency and frequency is denoted by the Greek letter nu and that wavelength is the one that's lambda. So I need to look for an equation that has these two variables in it and there it is, lambda times nu equals c what is C? Well, it's on here too. C is the speed of light, 2.998 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. So now, you know, it's one thing to have an equation sheet, it's completely other thing to know how to use it. And so that's where, you know, going through those study guides, chapter by chapter, module by module, where it tells you, hey, this is the, if these are the equations you need to know for this chapter, it can help you to make a lot of sense of this because this equation sheet is there for the entire semester. So there are constants on here, there are things on here that we won't see until near the end of the term. But what we can pull out of here is, well, you know what? There are a handful of equations these six in particular, that are useful to us in this particular set of, of chapters. And there are some constants, one, two, three, that are also of use to us because they relate to those equations. So with that in mind, I know what equation I need to use now. Now I just need to plug in the appropriate values. 2.998 times 10 to the 8 meters per second equal to lambda, which is what we're trying to find, times 3.6 times 10 to the 19 hertz. Hertz, remember, are reciprocal seconds, 1 over seconds. And so to get lambda by itself, I need to divide each side by 3.6 times 10 to the 19 reciprocal seconds. That'll cancel out this side. 
that'll cancel out the one over seconds on the other side and give us a wavelength in meters, which is how we would want to express wavelength anyway. So speed of light, 2.998 times 10 to the eighth, divided by 3.6 times 10 to the 19th is going to give us to two significant figures, because we only have two here in this frequency, 8.3 times 10 to the negative 12 meters. What else do we want to talk about? So, so I mean, really, the the scope of the questions that can be asked out of that are kind of limited, just because, as far as those equations go, we really only have three kinds of equations that you can do off of that. So, I mean, is it possible? Yeah, it's possible. But even at that, even if I ask you a question, you know, calculate the wavelength of light for a transition between the first and third energy levels, even if I asked you to instead calculate the energy or calculate the frequency, it would not be a far stretch for you to take the results of the first equation and input them into the next equation. So if you were asked a question like that, so you said bromine plus two. So let's let let's let's do that just for a second. So so if bromine we'll, we'll go noble gas here, bromine is argon four uh, S two three D ten. 4p5 so did it give you orbitals like this or did it just okay so okay so you don't have to worry about excited states for um You don't have to worry about excited states for Friday because I'm not going to ask you about them. So the question would be, so if this is bromine and I wanted to know bromine two plus ion. First of all, what does that mean? Am I taking electrons away or am I adding electrons? taking them away, because remember, charge is protons minus electrons. So I'm going to have two fewer electrons in this compared to where it was before. Got 4p5 there.
So the question is, what electrons do we take away? Now, what is the rule? Where do the electrons come from first? So we fill an atom from lowest energy to highest energy. We would evacuate an atom in the reverse order from highest energy to lowest. Because those highest energy electrons are also the furthest away. That's the, that's the, that's the, uh, the door example. So the question is, which electron in this middle configuration, which ones are the furthest away? It'll be the 4p5. So those electrons in the 4p, those are one we're going to lose. So if I lose those two electrons, it'll be 4p3. Where it gets a little bit wacky is if you start looking at the transition metals. Um, so you know, just to, as an example, if I'm looking at um, chromium, chromium is argon 4s1 3d5. So in addition to being wacky because it's an S1 exception, it's also wacky as a transition metal when we try to figure out where we're going to take those electrons from. So if I'm looking at the chromium 3 ion, I need to take three electrons out of this configuration. Where do they come from? So the first electron to come out is that 4s electron. Because same reason, it's the furthest away, it's the easiest to lose. After we lose that first one, then the remaining two come from the or only sublevel that's left, which is the 3d. So you can see this written as 4s0, 3d3, or just simply 3d3. So any transition metal, and this actually, this applies, this applies to even elements that are on the P block there that have D electrons available. So antimony would go through this, arsenic would go through this, bromine would go through this if it lost, you know, more than five electrons. And that would be, once you evacuate that P sublevel, because obviously that one's going to be, that one's going to be the one that's the easiest to remove. But let's say that we were looking at the bromine 6 ion. After we lose these five electrons, the sixth electron that we lose would be from the 4s sublevel. Because that 4s sublevel is still further away than those 3d. So. Okay, so we're talking about periodic trends. So the easiest trend is the, is the size trend. Because the size trend basically falls into two categories. Number of energy levels, more is better. And effective nuclear charge, more is smaller. And the, the rationale there, so I think it's pretty easy to visualize the, the more energy levels make the atom bigger part. You know, we, we kind of established that with the idea of more rows of desks make students further away from the, from the instructor. That, part, that part's not too difficult to, to see. The harder part to kind of put your head around is that idea of effective nuclear charge. And 
it's it's not the easiest analogy to to take in, but let's see if I can try to clarify a little bit of, of the way that we put this on Monday. Let's say that we were taking a test in here. And instead of the goal of the test being to do as well as possible, the goal of the test was to cheat as much as possible. And so your whole idea, your whole goal is you're, you're trying to get information relayed from, from one person to the other. Well, obviously here in the front row, it's going to be a lot harder for them to actually be close to each other because they are close to each other. And the further back you go, the easier it will be to do so. But let's say, for the sake of argument, let's say that you know, we're, we're building out this, you know, factory of, of testing and cheating here. And we have filled up the third row. Now we're going to fill up the fourth row. As the fourth row fills, you know, one person goes back there. And yeah, it, you know, it, it'd be easy for them to cheat if they were close enough to anybody to cheat. We have a second person. Now it's a little bit easier for me to start somebody to copy that. Yeah, and a third person is getting easier still. Well, that's what happens if you're just adding electrons to an atom. If you're just adding electrons to an atom, they would just continue to repel each other and the atom would get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. But that's not what happens. As we're building atoms, in addition to adding that electron, we're also adding a proton. Now, in the form of proton, let's say that instead of you just adding another student, another teacher gets added as well. So now instead of now instead of one person trying to monitor everything, there are now two people who are trying to monitor everything. What that gives you a success rate as students in terms of Gonna make it a lot harder. What if I have a third person? What if I have a fourth and a fourth? You know, things are getting easier in the back, but they don't have any more room to expand backwards. Yet, I'm adding more influence to help me with my task of keeping you all reined in. And that was happening inside of an energy. Inside of an energy level, yes, you can stack in more electrons, but if there isn't any more energy levels for them to expand out to, there's a limited amount of space that they can actually expand. But the nucleus is getting bigger while they do it. And so you've got this high power magnet in the center of the nucleus that pulling those electrons in and the electrons don't have any further way to go. And so that's the reason why this particular trend really doesn't have any exceptions to it, because it is so straightforward. More energy levels, the electrons can get further away, the nucleus has less of an influence on them. But if they can't get further away, and we continue to pack the nucleus full of protons, those protons are going to be able to pull them in and draw them in more because we're adding attraction without necessarily adding an equal amount of repulsion. So greater attraction, we're going to pull them in a bit. So that's the easiest trend. Luckily, ionization energy is kind of the opposite of that trend. So I wouldn't even think about it in terms of position. I would think about it again in terms of size. If I can memorize the size trend, I just know that I have to reverse it for the ionization energy trend. 
Big atoms lose electrons more easily. Small atoms lose electrons more difficult. Um, with those two configuration-based exceptions that we discussed, where we've got the full S sublevel versus the mostly empty P sublevel, so group two versus group 13, and with the half-filled P sublevel versus the unbalanced P sublevel, group 15 versus group 16. So for the most part, <coughs> you can think about those two trends as being basically the opposite of each other. So if you understand the size trend, you can basically just reverse the logic to understand the ionization energy trend. You just have to understand that there are those two exceptions that exist. And they exist primarily in those first four rows of the periodic table. So atomic radius is size. Yeah. So yeah, when we talk about atomic radius, we're basically talking about the distance between the nucleus and the last electron. That's another way of saying how big the atom. So atomic mass does not have a trend. No, because the, the periodic table is essentially in atomic mass order. Um, yeah, just generally speaking, as the nucleus gets bigger, the it weighs more. Yeah. So why is nitrogen more than oxygen? That's one, that's one of the exceptions there. So um, it has to do with the electron configuration of nitrogen versus the configuration of oxygen. With nitrogen, you've got you've got that half-filled sublevel. And we, we, we've made a point of talking about half-filled sublevels and full sublevels have unusually stable configurations compared to what we would expect. It's the same reasoning that we have for beryllium versus boron. Beryllium's higher in, a, in ionization energy than boron. It shouldn't be. But because it's got that full S sublevel and we're taking from the filled sublevel to do it, it requires a little bit more energy than we would expect. Whereas oxygen, its P sublevel isn't half filled, it's unbalanced. And so an unbalanced sublevel behaves normally. Balanced sublevels, for whatever reason, seem to just be energetically more stable than anticipated. Now, the only other trend out there is um, ion, ion, ionic sizes. And you have to remember, ionic sizes basically fall into two categories. If we're comparing ions to atoms, it comes down to electrons. More electrons it means more repulsion. It means bigger. Um, where a lot of people ran into trouble in that quiz that we did yesterday was confusing the charges. So, you know, phosphide ion, for example, P. You look at P and you go, okay, what kind of ion is P going to make? Based upon its position on the periodic table, we would say negative three. And we would be correct in doing so. But with negative three, that means that we've got three more electrons. Now, did we add any more protons in this process? No. Those three electrons are pure repulsion. So that ion expands due to the extra repulsion. I'm not bringing in any more teachers, but I am adding more students to the back row. So the atom grows as a result. Whereas for metals, metals lose electrons, 
And so in losing electrons, the number of protons hasn't changed, but the number of electrons has gone smaller. There's going to be a greater attractive force because there's less repulsion. So it really comes down to charges. Positive charges are small, negative charges are big. The other kind of ionic trend is what if we have a group of, of substances that all have the same number of electrons? We talked about the isoelectronic series, you know, looking at different substances that maybe they all have 10 electrons in them, um, like neon does. And for that, it's it's just an effective nuclear charge discussion. How many protons are in the nucleus? If all if if everything has the same number of electrons, we can assume that it has the same repulsion. So now it becomes a matter of attraction. Bigger nucleus, more attraction, going to shrink it. So those are the three trends that you're responsible for. So again, it comes down to, do we understand the concept of size? If we do, that basically takes care of both size and ionization, because ionization is basically just the opposite of it with those two weird exceptions. And then effective nuclear charge, looking at repulsion versus attraction. Number of electrons tell us repulsion, number of protons tell us attraction, and we can compare and contrast. Okay, which, which, which which non-metal is that the right one? Okay, so like like groups 14, 15, 16. All right, so yeah, group 14. Group 14 is, <clears throat> we don't talk about ions very much with group 14 other than looking at tin and lead. And tin and lead, we can almost think of like transition metals. Because um, you know, one definition that we have of transition metals is that basically they're the ones from the S block, you know, the end of the S block all the way to the staggered staircase. We can consider those transition metals because they, they have more of those kinds of properties to them. So tin and lead would fall into that category. We can also talk about bismuth um, kind of falling into that category as well. <clears throat> now for the nitrogen group, the nitrogen group for the most part behaves pretty uniformly, other than bismuth, since bismuth is a metal. Um, the nitrogen and the phosphorus and even the arsenic, you know, they will form negative three charges uh, when they act um, as ions. Um, antimony usually just behaves covalently, so we don't need to worry so much about that. And then for the oxygen group, um, pretty much all of them act as non-metals. Um, we just talk about oxygen and sulfur a lot more because they're a lot more reactive. But they all have the capability of being negative two in charge. It's just that selenium, tellurium, they, yeah, they're not nearly as reactive. There's not nearly as much of them. So they're just not as, they're not as useful to us. And then polonium is radioactive. And so, yeah, I'm not gonna do too much with polonium. Good. 
All right, so if we're trying to figure out, you know, whether or not a series of quantum numbers are allowed, we have to remember the rules around quantum numbers. So, for example, you know, question number 19 here. What L quantum numbers are possible when N is equal to 3? Well, we have to remember what the rules for L are. L starts at 0 and goes all the way to N minus 1. So in this particular case, if N is 3, N minus 1 is 2. So the only possible values for L would be from 0 to 2, which would be just 0, 1, and 2. That would be answer B here. The distractors are these plus and minuses, um, which are the magnetic quantum number. And you, the only way you know the magnetic quantum number is you have to know what the angular momentum quantum number was first. So um, the reason it's called M sub L is because it's dependent on L. So with the with that going in the same kind of direction, you know, we can answer question 20 as well. So just right off the bat, this if you get questions like this or, or similar, the things that you want to look for are the obvious mistakes. So for example, I want to look for values of n that are zero or negative. In this case, there aren't any, so we can move on. I want to look for values of M sub S that are not positive half or negative half. In this case, that doesn't matter either. And so where I can start looking is, do the other quantum numbers follow the, the rules? And so in particular, for L, are we going from zero to n minus one? So in letter A here, n is equal to two. And so if n is two, L can only be zero or one. So the fact that we're marking this as two, it can't be. So we can cross that one off of the list. We don't even need to go to the third quantum number. We've already eliminated it off the second. So for this second one, for B, N is equal to 7? Yeah, that's a possibility. Um, really, we can go all the way up to infinity because it isn't saying ground state. It's just saying what's possible. Is L allowed to be 0 if, if N is 7? Absolutely. L can be 0 anytime because it's describing an S orbital and every energy level has an S orbital. M sub L has to be zero. Well, if L is zero, M sub L has to be zero as well. MS is equal to negative half. That's a possibility as well. B is correct. Now, just for completeness here, let's go through why the other three are incorrect. And it comes down to, in this case again, L, L negative one, that's impossible. Just that's, that's one of those nonsense ones that, you know, hopefully you could pick out even before it got to this point. Um, N equals one, L equals two, same thing. And honestly, for letter E, same thing as well. You can't have L greater than N. All right. So discounting any of that other stuff, we'd be able to pick out these relatively easily if we know our rules for quantum numbers. And so, like I said, the easiest thing to do, the quickest thing to do with a multiple choice kind of question like this is try to eliminate the things that are the most blatantly obviously wrong um, because there will usually be at least one. Um, and so sometimes it's hidden in the N and the N sub S. In this case, it was hidden in the L you know, where we had a negative L value and we know that we can't go below zero. Well. Okay. I have an oxide ion, mass number of 16, atomic number of eight. 
Okay, so the first answer should be obvious, and it is. We know that there are eight protons. A couple of places that we know that. The bottom number is the atomic number. It's also been revealed that it's oxygen. And so oxygen on the periodic table is element number eight. Not to mention every single one of the options lists eight as the number of protons. So I have no wiggle room there. Now, using what we know about charge, we can actually eliminate most of this list by focusing next on the electrons rather than on the protons. I've got a negative two charge here. What does that mean in terms of protons versus neutrons or protons versus electrons? It's negative two. So that means I have more negatives. So I'm going to have more electrons. How many more? Which would be a total of 10. So I know that 6 isn't right. I know that 8 isn't right. I know that 8 isn't right. Even if I don't know, if, even if I don't have a clue about mass number, if I know this much, I can get it down to a coin flip. Now, coin flips aren't necessarily a guarantee, but coin flip's a lot better than one out of five if I am truly guessing. Now we have to figure out this mass number thing. Mass number is 16. It's protons and neutrons. Since I know I have eight protons, 16 minus eight is eight. It would be eight, eight, 10. Okay, so this is this is this is a definition question. What is a group? Same same vertical column, and if they're in the same vertical column, what do they have in common? Not in metallic nature necessarily. They have similar chemical and physical properties. So if I'm looking to answer a question like 14, which two elements would have the most similar behavior? That's what it's asking. Which two of these are going to have the most similar properties? So I would look for two that are in the same column. So it's calcium and strontium. So it wants to know the identity of X here. Well, so we should know that the charge on sodium is positive one because of its position on the table. So the fact that I have three of them means that I've got a total charge of positive three, which means X has to have a negative three charge to balance. So I would need to evaluate. So, you know, a couple of obvious answers here. Magnesium is not going to be one of them. Carbon doesn't make ionic compounds. So I've got to decide between these three. And, you know, from a charge standpoint, phosphorus is the only one that gives me a negative three. Number 11 is very similar to number 13. Luckily for us, number 11 was written for a slightly less sophisticated audience than number 13 was.
So if I'm looking at this particular isotope, how many protons are in it? Seventeen. It's chlorine. Atomic number is seventeen. Chlorine is element number seventeen, so it has seventeen protons. And so right away, C's out, E's out, E's out. We're down to A and B. And the difference between A and B is do you understand what mass number is? Uh, so the answer there is A. Because it's neutral, so if there are 17 protons, there are going to be 17 electrons. It's the same thing. I've got a mass number of 35. So 35 minus 17 to give me 18 neutrons. So if the, if the test question doesn't give you the atomic number, you can definitely get it from the periodic table because it's the same thing. It's the atomic number is the proton number. So it comes down to, do you understand charge? Do you understand mass number? That's, that's how you solve these kinds of questions. Mm -hmm. Well, but it is at the same time. So we know that wavelength and frequency are inversely related. The higher the wavelength is, the lower the frequency is. So if we're looking for maximum frequency, we should be looking for a minimum wavelength. And so while you could use the speed of light equation to test each one of these, you don't need to. The relationship itself qualitatively tells you that the smallest wavelength would give you the highest frequency. Which one? Okay, what is the difference between homogeneous and heterogeneous? Yeah. yeah it, it's all about appearance. So in both cases, we have multiple substances present and they are mixed together physically, which means that they can also be separated physically. The difference is how they appear. Homogeneous appears to be one uniform substance, even though it's not. Heterogeneous, you can clearly see multiple things in it. And so from that kind of perspective, sweet tea, homogeneous, you know, I mean, if you get a bad batch and there's tea leaves floating around in it, but I, I would like to think that you, you'd be able to, you know, see that and, or, or, you know, that would be given to you in some kind of way. Yeah. Yeah. So concrete's the correct answer. Inside of concrete, you can see the little rocks, you can see the pebbles, you can see the sand. So even if it's really well mixed cement, if you look down close enough at it, there is disuniformity in that sample. That's, you know, that's what it is. All of these other ones, you know, you, you couldn't tell just by looking at them that they were, that they were mixtures. Sweet tea, you're going to have a uniform brown liquid. Black coffee, you're going to have a uniform dark brown black liquid. Mercury metal isn't even a mixture, it's an element. IV solution, yeah, depending upon you know, what's mixed into that, it's going to have a colorless to yellow kind of appearance to it. But they're all homogenous. They all look like they're one substance. The only way that we could test definitively would be to try to boil them 
and separate the components. So I've got a liquid, I'm gonna to try to boil off the water and see if there's anything left over. And certainly with sweet tea and with coffee and with IV solution, you're gonna be left with tea leaves and sugar, um, uh, coffee residue, um, uh, salt. So a pure substance would be one that there's no, there's no variability in its composition. So in particular, we're talking about either an element or a compound. So seawater would not be an example of a pure substance. That would be a mixture because you've got water, you've got salt, you've got whatever else is floating around inside of that, that water. So what we're looking for is something that has a lack of variability to it that is of one substance and one substance only. You, you can name all the different components of blood. There's the plasma, there's the hemoglobin, there's the, yeah, there, there are many different components of blood. So that, it's not chemically pure. Okay, so So in the case of number three, table sugar is the only one that I can't name a second component to. Sucrose, that is its chemical formula. To change its chemical formula would be to change the identity of the substance. It's not made by mixing together multiple types of sugar. It is one unique compound. All of the others, we know that there are multiple things that go into it. You, you know, beer is made from a variety of ingredients. We can't even agree on an alcohol content for beer. Yeah, you've got different salts, you've got the water. I mean, as soon as you say two different substances, you're in the mixture territory. That's why brass is, is in there as well. It has copper and zinc. Oh, two different components. It's got to be a mixture. All right, uh, let's see. Okay. Um, okay. Um, this will be the last thing that we do. Um, but yeah, this is this is straight out of your uh, check your uh, second quiz. Right, to answer a question like this, we have to think about what we know and what we're trying to find. And so that's where that chart is a really great organizational tool, but also exactly why you can't use it because you need to be able to put this stuff together on your own. So what we need to think about is Ultimately, we are being asked to determine the number of carbon atoms. So I need to go from grams of carbon tetrachloride all the way to carbon atoms. Now, I know there's no single conversion that's going to take me there. What I have to figure out is 
is there a series of conversions that I can do that will ultimately land me where I want to go? And so the, if, if I know that I need a series of conversions, I know that moles are going to have to get involved in the process somehow. And so since I have a mass of carbon pet, really the only direction I can go with it is to turn that into moles of carbon pet. And we should know how to do that. 3.75 grams of carbon tet. I want to turn grams of carbon tet into moles. So we need to find the molar mass and we're going to divide by it. So How many chlorines did you put in there? Uh, four. I think you only had two. That that's better. Okay, so. That much we can do. Now, we're still not quite there yet. I can't go from moles of carbon pet to carbon atoms either. But I can do one of two things. And the order that I do these next two steps really doesn't matter because I'm going to do them both anyway. I either can turn this into molecules of carbon tet, which then can be converted into atoms, or I can turn this into moles of carbon, which I can then turn into carbon atoms. Now, like I said, which process we choose really doesn't matter, because ultimately in the end, we're going to use both conversions. It's just a matter of, do I do the mold conversion first, or do I do the mold conversion second? It really doesn't matter. If I want to do the mold conversion first, one mole of carbon tet would give me one mole of carbon. And then to turn moles of carbon into carbon atoms, I need Avogadro's number. So that would be that would be the first pathway. Second pathway would be essentially the same, only we keep the uh, Avogadro number stack first. So there's moles of all trees, Avogadro number of all trees in a mole. And then every molecule of carbon tet has one carbon atom in it. I I could easily go in either direction. But the, the key here is you have to recognize in some kind of way how to get from A to B. So in this case, uh, 1.47 times 10 to the 22nd carbon atoms. Ultimately, we were going to do these two steps in one sequence or the other. We were going to end up with the same answer regardless. Yeah, so, I mean, you could, you could do it in really in either way. The thing is, from a logical standpoint, it has to make sense to you how you got there. So... Of the atoms, and then there's one carbon 
in the molecule. So it would, it would be based on the substrate. So if we were calculating chlorine, this would have been one to four. Because there are four chlorines in the molecule. And honestly, that is that is probably one of the places where more people made mistakes with that particular quiz was, you know, either not knowing where to get started and just kind of hoping to make your way through it or <clears throat> not understanding that the chemical formula was really the key to understanding the problem itself. And, you know, I'm, I'm teaching, I'm actually doing this right now with my Chem 103 students and teaching that lesson after teaching you stoichiometry back-to-back -back hours, it was amazing how much I was saying the exact same thing to both groups. Because what we were doing with balanced chemical equations and stoichiometry, basically you're doing the same thing with a chemical formula. <coughs> you're just using the subscripts to tell you the relationship between the two atoms. All right, uh, again, thank you for coming out. Um, uh, I'll see you on Friday. Um, certainly stop by my office hour tomorrow or uh, just get in contact with me otherwise uh, if you get stuck or if you just want some more help. <laughs>